Well, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to our Mi Plus Plus seminar. Today, Matthew Bright will talk about two-dimensional lattice invariants, chemical and theoretical applications. Over to you, Matt. Please. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. So, so thanks for coming along. Uh, yeah, uh, just to give you, I'll go give you a quick overview of of the talk. Um, essentially, a lot of which is um, a lot of the background work here. Although I will go through it, is in a recent paper that we published in Acta Chris Day. The rest of it, uh, or if you want a, um, a deeper mathematical sort of exegesis of some of the consequences, and also I've taken some of the diagrams uh, from, from from Vitali's uh, sort of deeper mathematical investigation into this uh, into these invariants, and uh, which has all the sort of proofs and things that you might need. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of if you want to delve deeper into some of the details I'm going to go through. So I'm going to talk about kind of our general group problem as as, as we usually do, but hopefully very quickly, and then uh, run through uh, our the approach to how we solve the problem in the 2D lattice case. Um, then I'm going to kind of explore basically how we've started applying that even even for these very simple uh, simple structures of 2D lattices. Uh, First for um, first for kind of a large data set, um, as we've seen of um, uh, of two D lattices, or they're rather artificially generated. Then we're going to look at kind of some real two D materials and some some recent results on some of the publicly available databases of those, and and why they might be important. Uh, and then there's going to be kind of more slightly more theoretical coder uh, where we're going to talk about how we can use how we've been able to use the invariants to investigate a. a a sort of an, an interesting theoretical question about whether whether nature generates lattices random that is whether it, it fills uh it, it kind of generates all or some large reasonably large subset of the kind of all possible lattices at frequencies we would expect to see uh which is a more complicated question than you'd think um and uh we're gonna kind of talk about how we've how we've had a look at that and found that the answer is is perhaps a little surprising um or a little more surprising than we would originally expect. Uh, so yeah, as a very, very brief sort of schematic summary of what our problem is in general, chemically, is to, uh, you know, we can say it in one sentence, is finding a complete continuous isometry or rigid motion invariant of a periodic structure as a point in some space. And uh, those are all technical words, um, of course, and we can kind of use this schematic a little bit to unpack uh, what they mean um, and kind of the easiest thing to look at it are indeed the 2D lattices here. So we're talking here about sort of when we sort of say things like isometry or rigid motion, we're talking about the fact that ideally uh, we want, actually, you know, the best way to start would be to say when we want an invariant, what we mean is we want to map uh, to some, we, we might want to map to a point in some space, um, each a lattice. Um, by invariant under isometry and rigid motion, we mean that we want the same point in that space to represent um, a lattice that might have been rotated or translated. This is a, a rigid motion um, or, uh, or possibly reflected. Um, so if we add reflections to rotations and translations, we have, uh, as, uh, as we know, a full isometry. Um, and in the chemical sense, we may or may not uh, care about reflections because obviously some some structures uh, are left and right-handed and some aren't and this is kind of really central to to one of the things we're looking at in this in this talk but the point is that these are all transformations which don't really change distances between between points for any any, any point structure um, uh, and that's kind of what we care about because it doesn't really make sense to claim that if I move a, a crystal slightly to the left or if I turn it upside down, uh, that it's a different crystal because it, because it isn't. Um, and by complete, uh, we can unpack that to mean that we want to be able to go both ways. So we want, in a sense, to make sure that uh, we can uniquely unpack a unique periodic structure from a point in that space. Um, so, you know, obviously there's the, we can kind of write this down in notation, but visually that's what we mean. And then by continuous, uh, what we mean is, is some variant um, on this idea that if I have my periodic structure and I move it a little bit, or I move one of the points, which obviously means moving an infinite number of points that, that are in that translation class, uh, then what happens to this point that the, that the structure maps to is that it doesn't move very far 
in the space. And again, there are, there are various definitions of that to do with the relationship between how far I move the thing and how far the point moves in the space. Which, of course, um, gives us a, a kind of an underlying um, kind, kind of question, which is what do I mean by how far? Because uh, obviously that's, uh, that's not necessarily uh, very clearly defined. It will depend on the space. So we need what we need um, here is to make sure that this space is a metric space. That is that it has equipped on it some function where I can take any pair. Um, I can take any pair of points and I can spit out a non-negative real number that is only zero if the two points are the same, that is, is symmetric, it's the same forward as backward, and that satisfies this triangle inequality. If I kind of have to go between A and B by some other point C, it should take me longer, as it were, or it should take me further uh, than going there directly, so it all behaves like a distance. So kind of hidden under the idea of, of, of continuity is the idea of distance. But continuity is, of course, an additional requirement. Uh, I think uh, we know that sort of any metrics can be discontinuous. The most famous one that you get introduced to as a student is the discrete metric. So um, I can say, sorry, I've got this the wrong way around. There's a typo. The idea is if A equals B, my, uh, my distance is zero or should be zero here. This is a typo. And if A does not equal B, my distance should be one. That's a perfectly good metric. It's, uh, it, uh, um, it satisfies all the, uh, all the rules and it is not necessarily something from which we can derive something like continuity um, in, in the sense that we mean it here. So that is our problem. Um, and uh, so I should, yeah, uh, happy to take questions, by the way, all the way through, uh, if, if people stick a hand up, uh, of course, just to, to let people know. And what we care about here is a lattice, and just very quickly, uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about a lattice uh, as a set of integer combinations of some linearly independent basis. It's, it's exactly that simple, and it's exactly that simple in R3 and R, R4 and R, R, R whatever, as long as it's all uh, finite and you can pick a basis, then uh, you can you can um, you can make a lattice out of that basis by just giving you all the integer combinations. But we're going to confine ourselves here to two dimensions where there's uh, there's not so much elbow room and things get simpler, uh, but surprisingly sort of less simple than you'd think. Um, of course, those who are aware of lattices in terms of crystals know that we can just separate them into discrete classes. So uh, it's it's fairly easy to do that by uh, by their symmetry groups. Uh, and just as a technical, this um, there are really only five of these in two dimensions. There are the famous sort of fourteen Bravais classes in three dimensions. In two dimensions, we've got kind of five that also get called called Bravais classes. Uh, we've got a kind of a more a very general one, which is uh, just has kind of. Its symmetry group essentially has has two elements and an identity and kind of uh, it's centrosymmetric. You can invert through a point, and then we go up to kind of a couple of rectangular groups, which whose, whose symmetry groups are kind of isomorphic to the symmetries of the rectangle, either centered or primitive. And then you've got squares, and you've got kind of hexagon. You've got the hexagon, which is in, in a sense the maximal symmetry you can have for a two D lattice. Um, uh, just some terminology we'll we'll, we'll use throughout because it's, it's generally be, been accepted. Uh, we call, if you've only got your central symmetry in your lattice, uh, then, then you've got an oblique lattice. Everything else we'll call non-oblique um, is, is, is the technical term. Uh, okay, but just a comment on the, on the notation you're using. So, I mean, I don't understand what you mean by central symmetric and the same time C2. And also, oh, so that might be a typo. It, it should be possibly C1. Uh, not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, so the, so the, um, the, 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 the notation I'm using here is the name of the symmetry groups. Yeah, but I just mentioned that if you use, if you mean the dihedral groups by these D2, they have no reflections. So that's why it's a bit, uh, a bit mixed up with. Because you say explicitly that you include the reflections, but then the symbolism you use is a bit uh, misleading. My, my, my understanding is that dihedral groups do. The dihedral groups, you have just a, just a main rotation axis and then two fault axis perpendicular. Um, this is D2 or D4 or D6, it's exactly what, does it, what it means. Uh, in two dimensions, 
in two dimensions, D D D six is the, the the sort of for example is the the dihedral group uh, with six rotation and, and and six reflection elements. Is uh, so you so you know, these are, these are, this is kind of more of a so this I don't I don't 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 I mean if the symbolism I. I understand what you mean is 6mm or 4mm. I mean, there are these international symbols, but uh, it's a bit misleading to use these Ds. This was my point on um, Moise, my, my ask if um, with, so if groups in dimensions two and three might have different, different meanings. I mean, I haven't, if you have some capital letters, normally these refer to the three dimensional space or they don't refer to the two dimensional. <laughs> But uh, oh, I see. Well, so we, we mean really uh, two dimensional polygons here. So D6 yeah. for us is the group of symmetry of the regular hexagon. Yeah, this is something like 6 mm. I mean, if you lose okay. the international symbolism, yeah, or 4 mm, or well, mm2, or something like that. So well, we yes. see even in, in mathematics, uh, well, yes, of course, no, notations uh, might have different meanings, but in uh, in in standard algebra, D6 is, is, is called the group, symmetry group for a regular hexagon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, am, I understand that in crystallography and three dimensions, it might mean yeah, different objects. Yeah, it's called this is the, the so called dihedral groups, as far as I know. I mean, because mm -hmm. maybe okay. I'm also mistaken, but uh, and normally if I see D6, what I think is a group of the type 6 to 2 and not 6 mm. Right. So, okay. Matt, that's why we need uh, more rigorous definitions uh, sure. written yeah, more explicitly. Okay, thank you. Oh, you can use the international symbolism. It will be completely, let's say, in that case, it could be, and there's like 6 mm, 4 mm. So. Yes. My, my impression is the word oblique refers to whether the lattice angle is 90 degrees or not. I think in early conversations we had been advised that that crystallographically that that, that this, this is how the term oblique and non-oblique is used. I don't think that's true in crystallography. Perhaps Maurice could tell me. Okay. Um, we we could consider different uh, different names. We've I, I mean we've used this in 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 various various papers. I mean we we, we have specifically defined it. it. We can change it. I mean here specifically we we are saying that. Okay, so let me let me post the link to the Wikipedia page about the hedral groups. So yeah. your list notations. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, I, I mean, in this, in this case, we are, we are, we are using sort of non-oblique simply to mean anything that has more than, um, more than one kind of symmetry element, more than the, more than the inversion element, um, in its symmetry group. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, for example, and, and obviously, as we know, sort of any lattice can be represented by multiple basis vectors. You know, very simple example is if I take any v one zero and I take any n in the integers and I and I add sort of n one, uh, then I've got the square lattice. Uh, uh, you know, so so and that that will sort of become important when we talk about random lattice. Filling later, and this is not generally a problem in, in, in crystallographic terms because we can always define a reduced basis by some set of kind of equipment. So we have some set of inequalities and special conditions which we can prove confine us to a, to, to a unique expression uh, of a lattice, to a unique basis. For example, the, the, the one we use here is we say that one vector, you know, the vectors must be ordered by length, uh, that there's a particular constraint on the value of the um of of the dot product the inner product uh of the vectors and then we have to kind of handle oh sorry and then we have to kind of handle the case where two 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 vectors are of equal length and then we say that that uh that, that we must we can kind of pick either 
um, and, and we just kind of pick, uh, uh, pick a pick, and we can have a positive or a negative uh, angle, as it were, and we can pick a negative one. And this un unambiguously defines the two D lattice up to rigid motion, although not necessarily uh, not necessarily isometry, so not necessarily reflection, which is is what we'll get to. Um, but we can uniquely define that, but then we fall over with the kind of continuity requirement. And this is a diagram from, from, from one of our earlier papers kind of uh, that, that, that I put together to, to kind of neatly illustrate this, uh, which, which is that uh, what we can imagine is we can pick some, uh, we can pick this particular condition, and then we consider taking, we can consider taking a lattice uh, with uh, a sort of uh, one zero, and start at zero one and kind of then sort of vary, uh, vary the, the lattice angle of, of length one through a number of, um, through, you know, all its possible values within the, the, the sort of reduced basis. Um, and at a certain point as it passes through the, um, as it, as it passes through the kind of uh, the most symmetric point, as it passes to the point where there is a square lattice, there will be a, a sort of discontinuity. Um, so the R reduction conditions will pick uh, a discontinuous, will, will pick a, di a very different basis geometrically. Uh, so the point, so that the kind of the actual basis vectors will change, uh, will, will change discontinuously. And this is the problem that we are uh, that we're faced with, if 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 we're trying to create a a continuous basis, as it were, or if, we're, if we're trying to derive an isometry invariant that is continuous, uh, we run up against this problem. Uh, can we just pick? Maybe we can just pick a reduction uh, that will do this for us. Maybe we just pick the wrong reduction. As it turns out, we can't. As uh, and as far as we know, that that, that, that holds a dimension. It certainly holds a dimension two. Uh, it holds a dimension three. This has been been proven. So we need more than just a basis for our invariant. Uh, we um, and in fact, what we need, um, as those of you who have seen elements of this talk before will know, is uh, is a superbase uh, and indeed an obtuse superbase. So basically, this is this is a very simple idea. It's just a, a, a lattice basis plus an additional vector, uh, which is the negative sum of the basis vectors. And the lattice superbase is obtuse uh, if all of the essentially all the angles between the vectors are. Uh, or, or obtuse or, or right angles. Uh, and it, as it turns out, uh, sort of proven in various places by various people, which is why it has lots of names, this pick of the superbase is unique up to, um, up to inversion and obviously kind of vector permutation and rigid motion. And thus the, uh, and we can pick the two shortest vectors of the three to form a reduced basis. And this is kind of variously called the selling reduction, or it's called the loan reduction. Uh, and, and, and it's appeared in various uh, in various situations uh, for that reason. And, then, and this is the one that we use because it turns out that this uh, this is the secret, and we're hoping it's the secret in three dimensions as well uh, to to getting our continuity um, to work. Uh, so 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 we pick this. Um, I'm sorry, it's again the kind of question probably of nomenclature. But uh, I don't understand what you mean, centrosymmetric inversion in two dimensional space. Well, I suppose it's inversion through a point. In, the, in, in two dimensional space, it's not existing. You don't have, a, you don't have an inversion in two dimensional space. Well, Matt, could you give a formula? X, Y maps to? X, Y maps to minus Y minus X, doesn't it, or something? No, no, no. Minus, minus X minus, X minus Y. Minus X but minus this is, Y, But yeah. this is just a two-fold rotation. You, yes, if you wish, you could call it a like two-fold rotation. So I studied it at school as central symmetry. But yeah. two-fold rotation is also fine. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, what is what we understand by central symmetrical inversion, we mean always the three-dimensional. It can exist just because... The feature, the characteristic, is a determinant minus one. And of course, with matrix of the type minus one, minus one, you cannot have a determinant minus one. You can have it only in odd dimensional spaces. Of course, of course. Yes. Of course. OK. So but today we discuss only two dimensional lattices. Yeah. And that, is in the plane. Yeah, yes. and that's why I'm using these. At least for me, it is uh, 
a bit misleading as I told you. Okay, okay fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, we need to write more explicit formula. You are right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's a good. I'll I'll try and make sure that's in any updates um, to things. Um, and because this is this, this is in, indeed an invariant and reduction, uh, we can then define uh, rigorously this idea of a root invariant on it. Um, and also, we can define this notion of a sign. So we can uniquely pick the two shortest vectors in order, and we can we can give a essentially a uh, a mirror. We can we can determine kind of discrete chirality, a sort of left and right handedness, as it were, by uh, giving the lattice the sign of the determinant of the matrix whose columns are v1 and v2. Um, so that's uh, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, you can you can also think about it about whether the vectors as you order them in size go clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, in a in a more informal sense. But this is the the the, the kind of the, the best way of computing it. And then having arranged that, we compute the root forms of the lattice as being the real inner product uh, roots, uh, which are the yeah the, the roots of the square root of the inner pro of the negative of the inner product. And since the negative of the inner product is in the chief superbase, so it'll be positive. So these are this is a triple of uh, of real numbers. Um, and in fact, it will if we've ordered the vectors in the manner that we've we've ordered there, uh, the root invariant will also. Um, uh, be uh, be ordered so that you'll you'll see sort of R one two will be the smallest R one and R O two will be uh, will be in order, and we can make that kind of if we that that is then an isometry invariant uh, because uh, because the um, the superbase is uh, but the orient but we can make it kind of orientation aware we can take away reflections uh, by differentiating it by a sum sorry differentiating is a mathematical term of course we can uh uh by 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 adorning it by decorating it with a sign and then we've got plus and minus so so the question i have is you know i understand that this is continuous in this form and i understand why this is a good invariant thing but let us say where we have the case where v1 and i'm just talking about the magnitude here is equal to v2 minus epsilon and then transitions to v, v2 plus epsilon. So the order has been re reversed. Yes. What I don't see here is the proof that that is a continuous uh, mapping on the invariant. Um, because I'm kind of presenting results. I don't go into depth in the proof here. The proof does uh, exist um, and is in the reference given one. Well, it's, it's in the second reference given at the beginning. Okay. Uh, it, uh, I mean, the, I suppose, I don't know, an informal way to think about it is that sort of when you do that, uh, the the third vector and the requirement for obtuseness kind of snaps the superbase uh, back into whatever is is the most sort of continuous sort of it, it kind of forces it back into continuity as it were you don't they, they, it kind of limits the choice Matt, you have had earlier uh, a nice picture illustrating discontinuity of reduced bases and if there was an extra vector Showing yes. a super base, what picture might be enough? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I was thinking of putting the other picture in. I, I do have a picture kind of uh, kind of illustrating it. Uh -huh. uh, but, but anyway, okay. the reference, yeah, the reference to the theorem, I mean, more exact. So theorem with yeah. number in that paper would be helpful. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, but it, it, yeah, so so there is a, yeah, you can, you can imagine this as, yeah, it, it kind of, Perhaps if I if I go back up, you could you possibly if you can see my pointer here, mm -hmm. um, you you can kind of imagine that if um, if we're going sort of backwards here. So obviously my my second my third vector is the diagonal um, across here, yeah. be obviously in the in the obtuse superbase. And what happens if I go backwards here as I pass through this symmetric? Um, 
uh, this, uh, the, the, this kind of symmetric point is that rather than being this acute vector, the, the requirement of the obtuse superbase will actually force it to, to take the form where it just... Um, I see. Yeah, where, 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 where it, where, where, yeah, I mean, it will be, in, in essence, it will kind of look like a discontinuous change, but what you'll get out is a basis that is isometric, that, that can be yeah. related. Yeah, by the appearance is almost that those, those two that, uh, where you've labeled identical lattices, have switch positions. Yes. I see, I see that. Yeah. Okay, it will, it will thank you. Force them to switch position. So uh, the, the image I always have in my head is is is, is a, you're kind of wrapping a rubber band around these three, um, uh, these these three vectors, and kind of I don't know the tension is forcing it to behave in a certain way. Um, but yes, so as a consequence, we can continuously map to a uh, to, to to these to these three numbers, and because we can continuously map to these three numbers, we can kind of very naturally. Uh, consider these as points in in Euclidean space. Sorry, that should be a capital E there. Uh, in in R three. Okay, so we so we've got a space that we can we can map to. And if we think about the non oblique lattices in the terminology that we're we're using now, they occupy sort of boundaries of the code, sort of various intersections of hyperplanes, either where uh, R O one sort of equals R O two, and you've got this kind of orange wall here, or you've got um, You've you've got various you know one or other of the um, one or other of your uh, your vectors is your your inner products is zero, and you've got a you've got a square lattice or the yeah so there's a, there's a couple of boundaries which give you a centro which give you a, a centered rectangular lattice and this kind of bottom where one of the one of the angles is is zero gives you your your primitive rectangular lattice um, and it's it's. You know, you can you can see geometrically that where that well, what happens when, uh, you know, two of these rectangular lattices, these kind of central rectangular lattices, kind of meet in a single line. You've got the uh, the hexagon, and and what happens is you kind of move towards the intersection of centro symmetric lattice of, of, of sorry, not centro symmetric of of centered rectangular lattices with rectangular lattices uh, that sort of becomes a square. You can imagine that kind of continuously. So, so, so you've got kind of various subspaces. So you've got intersections, you've got high planes and lines where they meet. So you've got you've got various subspaces. If I care about rigid motion, uh, if I care about rigid motion rather than isometry, uh, the way we handle that in 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 our particular kind of uh, way of looking at things uh, is we create this map. Now that we could we could pick any. Essentially, any reflection. These sides is what what we're doing is we're kind of gluing a reflection to one of these uh, one of these boundaries. But in this case, the the most obvious map is to double the triangular cone. And essentially, what that means is that I'm mapping. I just switch the 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 two of the uh, two of the coordinates uh, when I uh, if if the sign happens to be negative. So so that gives us a kind of three dimensional space. Uh, but three-dimensional spaces are hard to visualize, and we want to turn these things into maps. Kind of the motivation of all of this stuff is we want to be able to show chemists maps of structures that they can look at and explore. Uh, so maybe we want to take a, a, a bit of a slice through this map so that we can put it in a in a paper, in a chart. And there's kind of a natural way of doing that, that we're by by um, essentially just intersecting some sort of hyperplane with the triangular cone, and then and then maybe doing a bit bit more mapping to make the thing more intuitive. So we define this idea of the size of a lattice as just the sum of all of its root invariants. So there's a couple of nice, so people are, are, are often, I'm, I'm aware because we've, we've had comments of this in the paper, uh, people are used to the idea of thinking of the size of a lattice as being about its determinant because there's this, this kind of natural concept of volume. But the size has a number of advantages here. It has a kind of spatial advantage and it's a bit more meaningful in terms of a section of the, um, a section of the triangular cone, we can just drop a hyperplane. Uh, and sigma equals one is what we what we do here is the most natural thing. So, so the, the sum equals one, and the other uh, and the other reason uh, that's slightly more practical is that things like size all of these and the reason we take square roots is because that means that you're in the units that you're working with. So a root a, a, a root a, a particular value in a root invariant is in angstroms. The size of this lattice is in is in angstroms. 
uh, it all it all kind of works out. Uh, then we take a slightly different map. And the reason we do this is 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 so that we've got kind of a uh, a way of we've got a way of, uh, of of handling rigid motion in a bit through a, a, a very intuitive gluing operation. Uh, we actually map so we divide everything by this by the size the scale so that that is equivalent to uh, projecting everything to this uh, this plane sigma equals one. Uh, and we multiply the, the Z coordinate, the height by by three, because that gives us a, a nice intuitive sort of right angled uh, isosceles triangle to work with, with, with vertical and horizontal side lengths of one. So we've got, we, uh, we've, we've got kind of a neat, and obviously the, where that maps out to is that this is the intersection, is that the boundaries now, so these, these uh, hyperplane boundaries are now just line boundaries of the triangle. You can see these are the the kind of um, these orange place these orange boundaries are where the centered rectangular lattices live. These this green boundary is where the rectangular lattice lives, and we've got uh, we've got the the hexagon and the square are now a single point rather than a line. So this is just a just a projection, um, and this then uniquely specifies a two D lattice up to what we'd call similarity, which is a combination of isometry and scaling. So now your equivalence class of lattices. Um, is any lattice that is the same under under reflection, rotation, translation, and any scaling. Uh, how do we deal with orientation aware projected invariants? Uh, well, we kind of glue one of these boundaries together. But in this case, rather than gluing, I think we, we kind of effectively glued the, the boundary on this side together here. We create this map that goes from x to y, x, y to 1 minus y, 1 minus x for a negative, a negative lattice. And that gives us a square. So we've got this is what we call the quotient triangle. Quotient, obviously, like with a sort of quotient group, we're quotienting out by by scale and by isometry. And we've got um, here the the quotient square. And I've just kind of illustrated the idea here is that if I've got two lattices which are reflected across this boundary, then they are related by uh, by a reflection. So, so hopefully that's nice and clear. These bars are just a little shorthand so that the notation gets doesn't get ugly to remind us that we've scaled by uh, by by size, by, well by size in the way that we defined it by sigma. And then we can think, and then this is where we get to chiral distances. So what we care about now is we want to ask, okay, so we've got this continuous space. What can we do? With it? Well, one thing we can do is we can say. Rather than having these these very binary ideas of of uh, of chirality as being either sort of left or right handed, plus or minus, we can start to think of sort of how asymmetric is a lattice. We've uniquely defined it; it's sitting in a nice continuous space. So we can start to think of defining a way of saying, well, how asymmetric is this lattice? How far from being, uh, you know, a, a centered rectangular lattice, or how far from being a square lattice is it? How much distortion would I have to take it through? And I can work that out uh, by by kind of defining this thing called the G chiral distance. Uh, so I can I can use this essentially. So we're using G chiral distance here as a very general term. Okay, what we mean is if we've mapped this to a space and we've got a metric that functions on that space, then I I can simply define, uh, and then I obviously have to explicitly define it the uh, the chiral distance as that metric by that metric the nearest point in the space which represents um, represents a lattice with a particular symmetry group. So that's uh, that's how I can kind of define asymmetry and in three dimensions here. That's the nearest uh, the nearest to a line or perhaps to a, uh, a hyperplane boundary and in the quotient triangle or the, the quotient square, then it is the nearest point to, to kind of the boundary of, sorry, the quotient triangle, the nearest point to the boundary of the triangle, or, you know, very simply the distance to a, uh, to, to these two vertices representing hexagons and, and the square. Hello. So, uh, so just, just to comment that in terms that the crystallographers are often interested in, what for instance, the D4 chirality distance, those projections are also, at least in this space, the least square solution for the best that could be. So, so it's not just, you know, because crystallographers don't often think of these as projections. They, are, they, they say, well, what's the best one? 
and it's the best one in the least squares sense. Yes. Yeah, we can we can we can we can do that, and we can make a kind of make a general idea of asymmetry by just having a nearest a kind of maximizing the distance from all boundaries. I'm just saying that you know if you explain it to the, to the crystallographer in terms of oh this is the best in a certain sense, he yeah. will understand that a little more than the more slightly more abstract way that you've stated it here. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's that, that 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 is a good point. Yes, we are. If you are if you are looking for the least square lattice, or you are looking for the, uh, you, if you care about asymmetry, and, and a bit later on we'll talk about why there is there are some very good reasons why you care about trying to make something which is very asymmetric, because um, it might have some some useful properties. Uh, then you know this we can say well we can tell you where to look at least for the least symmetric lattice. We can tell you where, and if you're trying to kind of simulate some materials. Make put your lattice parameters, uh, you know, extract your lattice parameters in some neighborhood, you know, in the middle of the triangle, or, or similar to 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 work that out. Um, so I'm just giving you an example here because we've got kind of in the paper we've got a lot of these, you know, because we can we you can you know you can define them and we'll do, you know there's an entire other space that we look at in a second which is slightly more convenient in various ways. But so for example the projected default chirality distance which we you know, we use this sort of notation for, uh, and is the Euclidean, and you know, this notation PC, the two says that we're using an L2 distance. We could of course use any Minkowski distance uh, in the space. The L infinity distance would be the sort of, the sort of max distance, the Chebyshev distance, but here we're saying two. So PC two D four is just the straight line distance to the point zero, zero. That's, that's, that's really all it is. Um, and similarly, we can, we can say the, the root Slightly more complicated. We've got to find a kind of distance along the orthogonal projection to, uh, uh, to 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 the to a particular axis to the the kind of the, sorry, well the x-axis. I should have said this sort of RO two axis or whatever in uh, in, in R three so that to to one of the one of the three axes. So so we can we can kind of define that, and obviously in a similar way we can define the the d six distance. And then the D2 distance is, of course, a bit more complex because I've got to make some decisions about uh, which uh, about which of these is a minimum. Uh, but hopefully you can see without me kind of writing down a lot of algebra to memorize that, that, that these are all these are all calculable things that we can write down explicit expressions for them. Um, and indeed, they are computable and they can be computed and there'll be a link to the code where you can you can play with this stuff at the end. Go. Uh, just a brief moment. Obviously, this extends to metrics in general, which we're not really going to talk about. We haven't we haven't played around with those as as much as yet. But obviously, this extends to to metrics in general. Uh, and um, the the what the problem, or rather the complexity, uh, in the case of trying to to extend this to a metric in general, to say, well, let's measure just the distance between any two points in this space is for lattices of opposite sign, we can't really do that. Not only do we have to consider uh, moving across, not, not only do we consider, to have to consider a reflection across the boundary we happen to have glued on, uh, but we do actually have to consider the distance uh, across all such boundaries. You can think of this geometrically as the idea that if I have to deform my lattice through a, through a symmetric point, through a, through a point that has, has, um, has higher symmetry, uh, I can't really know in advance which one that is. I can't know wh which direction to go. I've got to. I've got to test them all, as it were. So this is this. Th this creates a slight awkwardness. Again, it's it's um, it's it is surmountable. Uh, it, it is just a question of minimizing over a finite number of of computations. Uh, so so this is uh, th this is is not massively complicated, but it is slightly awkward. So is there a more natural way which we, where we can situate two lattice, um, uh, two, two lattices of opposite sign in the same space? Uh, and the way we, one of the ways we've chosen to do it so far is to, um, is to map this thing to a sphere. Now this thing does map to a sphere in the sense that if you recall, well, a punctured sphere, uh, if you recall all of these sides are implicitly glued together. Okay, so this, this does in fact have the topology 
uh, of a sphere, but with a point missing. The point is missing because the point one zero out here is a kind of idea. I mean, a limit is a is, is a slightly informal way of putting it. Uh, but as you kind of head your lattice out to this point, it is becoming infinitely long and infinitely thin, uh, or some combination of of both. So it's it's in a sense this this point is is not meaningful uh, in in terms of actual lattices. So we can remove it. So this thing becomes a punctured sphere. So we can imagine any number of uh, of ways in which we could we could define a map from the from this this triangle with the point missing uh, and the sides glued to a punctured sphere. Uh, but we pick a kind of nice, a, a kind of a fairly natural one when we take the inside in circle uh, of uh, of the triangle. That is the circle that is um, uh, that is inscribed within it, maximal circle that is subscribed subscribed within it. We define a sort of Greenwich meridian, so we define zero degrees in terms of longitude and latitude uh, as the line, as the point opposite the point where the line passes through the sort of the forbidden, the limit point, um, as it were. And then we kind of, uh, and then we we compute the uh, the anti-clockwise angle or the clockwise angle as a kind of longitude or latitude in degrees, a, a longitude in degrees, and the latitude is then just the fraction. Uh, towards the boundary of the triangle along which you've gone. So, so that's that's how you that's how you kind of map to the sphere. And then we simply formally say that if you're a positive lattice, we'll map you to the northern hemisphere, and if you're a negative lattice, we'll map you to the southern hemisphere. And then all positive and negative lattices are all sitting on a punctured sphere uniquely. Uh, my boundary, my triangle boundary, now becomes an equator. Um, and my my kind of uh, where where I can see all my um, Higher symmetry lattices. So, so I now have this this nice spherical space, uh, and I don't have to think about reflections anymore uh, across lots of boundaries to minimize. I can start thinking about the um, I can start thinking about the uh, the just distances on a sphere, which is indeed what I do. Is this map sort of clear to everybody? Uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully that's uh, it's good that's, for me. Yeah, good, 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 good. Yeah, because it's, it's a rather complicated thing. I mean, there, there could be an animation or something, but uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 fairly intuitive. And then once you've got that, you can start looking at sphere metrics, and there's a very nice sphere metric. It's sphere met. It's a spherical metric of you know sailors have wanted to find out say the shortest distance between two points on a sphere for fairly obvious reasons for hundreds of years, uh, and since the 1800s, the, the people have published charts of what's called haversine distances. Uh, there's a again, there's a, there's a sort of algebraic um uh expression for this uh, but we can describe it as as being the shortest distance along any great circle between two points for a sphere of a given radius it's a very kind of natural uh metric on the sphere um it's it, it's obviously uh it's got obviously kind of got a finite number of finite range of values um and here i've just taken a um uh a, a random lattice at roughly uh Roughly latitude fifteen, longitude sixty five. So nearly picked so that you can kind of see both the square and the um, hexagonal lattice here. Sorry, longitude fifteen, latitude sixty five. So that you can uh, and you can kind of imagine these great circles. Um, the chirality, the, the g chirality distance. Then we can we can define or a spherical chir g two chir d two chirality distance or a spherical g chirality distance um, is just this have a sign distance that. Uh, uh, which which is uh, to either the specific point um, representing the square or the hexagonal lattice or the uh, um, the point on the equator that's nearest, which is obviously the point which shares the same latitude, but is it says it shares the same longitude, but is at latitude zero. Okay, and we assume the sphere is a radi radius one. So here it is uh, embedded in R three. We, we you know the, the underlying kind of again fairly natural assumption is that it's a radius one sphere. Uh, sitting with its its center at the at the origin in R three. This uh, this lattice has been generated and brought to you by the way by the code, which I'll give a link in the uh, um, at the end. Uh, so so we've got a, we're, we're kind of close to getting a, a complete and, and and fairly extensive kind of toolkit for for messing around with these and plotting them and exploring and exploring the space. Uh, so this is all projected. We don't care about scaling. How do we bring scaling back in? If we care about scaling, well, one way to do this. Um, is to put the height back in. Uh, so, so we can just add a third coordinate and just say you've got you've got you've got kind of two angles, 
and a height. So I've, I've given this height 10, as it were. I don't know if this is exactly height 10. This isn't, this isn't a precise diagram. It's more of a schematic. But now we can imagine this kind of hovering above the sphere of radius 1. This, this distance is, is, is 10 units or 10 angstroms. Um, and then we've got some, rather than, you, you kind of can't do the have assigned distance on this, really, or you can. I mean, I suppose you could measure the have assigned distance uh, to some notional point on the sphere that also happens to be radius 10. Or alternatively, you could just consider these as points in R3 and measure the Euclidean distance. Uh, so, for example, if I care about the, the, the square, now the square becomes not just this point on the surface of the sphere, it's actually a line running at 45 degrees through this axis, and I need to also project the line and work out the distance there. And obviously for the um, for, for the D2 distance, I'm just that now kind of everything else is just the plane going through the equator. So the plane Z equals zero, and I can measure this distance to it. So we've got uh, some, some uh, we, can, we can have distances between uh, isometry, well, in this case, rigid motion invariants, and we can, uh, or we can have, Differences between those and, and projected invariants, depending on whether we include the height or not. Uh, so, so again, hopefully that's uh, that's nice and clear. Okay, so that's the theoretical run through of the talk over. How am I doing for time? Um, taking a bit longer than I thought, but uh, uh, we'll we'll run through some some results. Um, so, Matt, so so you don't need to rush if you would like to um, postpone a part, uh, one half of your talk for next Friday. It's also fine, okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll so we'll see how far we get because there, there are some results here. But before I go on, obviously, is anybody sort of not convinced by anything or would like um, would like more details on anything? Because I'm about to show sort of some results on some data sets now. So hopefully that's so, so the piece that you didn't come back to, as far as I can see, I understand about the projection onto each of the types, but what you didn't come back to is distance between two lattices where you had to do to all of the others. I presume you also have to do that in this case. Not well, in this case, we can, we can, yeah, well, no, because we don't, because the, the, the um, a positive and a negative lattice are all uniquely represented in this case. So I can just yes. take the have assigned distance between two points on the sphere. And if but one of them happens to, to be below the equator and one of them happens to be above the equator. Um, but you have to do that for all the representations. You but all the representations just... are just across the equator. No, no, no. Uh, Matt, invariant. So explain it's a unique representation by a point. Yes. Two. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's uniquely represented by a single point. So each lattice is uniquely represented by a single point. Well, and the with, is, that, is that true on the sphere or within a triangle? It's true in both. So all we've done with the sphere really is we've uh, is 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 we've we found a way of so so that uh, it's more that the triangle kind of hides the fact that there are implicitly fundamental domains reflections across all boundaries, whereas here we've kind of, rather than having kind of this awkward separate triangular boundary, we've put the entire boundary of the triangle as an equator and then just yes. glued two hemispheres together. Right. So this is the gluing operation. In what this gluing, what that looks like for a triangle is gluing triangles on all three sides. Yes. But this is just a simpler and more intuitive way of doing that, so that then, then you can just very easily see that you're just taking the shortest distance across the equator if you have two signs of two two lattices of opposite sign. Well, if they have the same sign, if they have the same sign, they'll both be in the in the northern hemisphere, as it were, and that they, 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 you know we we will we'll take that distance. So but it might but, help if you return in, to the triangular map and explain again uh, on a triangle because it's easier. Yes. Uh, so in a triangle, um, in a triangle, if I have two, um, if I happen to have two um, two lattices that are of the same sign, then they will live in in the quotient triangle. Okay, and yes. I will just simply measure the Euclidean distance between them. Okay. In this case, um, 
if they're of opposite sign in the triangle case, I have this, this, this kind of slight awkwardness where I have to remember that implicitly there are, in fact, a sort of strictly an infinite number of, of kind of fundamental domains all glued together in triangles. Um, yep. but, I, but I have to think about kind of reflecting across all the adjacent ones. Yes. With this map, the slight, it just gives you the slight extra convenience of saying, well, instead of reflecting across, like all of the boundaries are the same boundary now, they're all the equator of a sphere. So I just have to think about my journey across the equator between two points. Uh, and again, if I have the same, if, 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 if my lattices have the same sign, well, it, it, it will simply so happen in this mapping that they will be in the same hemisphere. So, but if they have opposite signs, they may only differ by a tiny amount. Well, that depends on whether you, if they have opposite, yeah, but if, yeah, they may, in which case they will be very close to each other across the equator. Okay. There, is a, there is a slight awkwardness we're concealing, which we're trying to fix with a, a, a more rigorous map now to the plane, which is that when you get close to this forbidden point, this one zero, uh, there are some, Mark, the question is simple, a simple question. So, yeah. Larry, could, could, could you ask maybe again your question? So, so if you, well, let's consider a point going back to the original where the, where the V1 and V2 are yeah. nearly equal. Where are those points on the sphere? Nearly. Uh, all, they will be very close together. Uh, but on the sphere, where they are they uh, near the equator? Well, if they're very well, if they, if they're nearly equal, then they will be somewhere on the sphere, but very close together. If they're nearly equal but related by a reflection, they will be on either side of the equator, but very close together. But very, but very close together. So near the equator. Mark, near the equator. They, they, yeah. Larry, do you see the blue square? Yes. So what point where all square lattices live? So up to scaling all square lattices are at least blue point. Yeah. And you're absolutely uh, so, right. So yeah. if we were to, to take a, a very large number where V1 and V2 are very nearly equal, they're all going to be near that blue point. Yes. They're going to be in a neighborhood. The chirality. Yeah, they're going, to be, they're going to be in a neighborhood of that square. And as you move around that neighborhood, you might move across the equator. And what's actually happening is you're going like that. Well, well, because it's uh, because it's an obtuse superface, you're going like that. But in fact, the obtuse superface is then going to just snap back to. Okay. So when that happens, okay, I, I'm trying to picture in my mind that the metric stays continuous, but I th I think I see that. Perhaps it would be useful to. I mean, uh, the, to me, the concept. No, no, never mind. I understand. If you were to draw a little circle around the blue and say, you know, this is all where V1 nearly V2, then that fits in my head better. Okay, that's a but useful I, that's that, that's a useful picture to 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 add to some some slides in the talk. Thank you. Yes, you know, so maybe you throw to... ten random points in that circle or something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So in, in the future, we'll include animations. Yes. Ah. <laughs> says Vitaly nodding at me and like, <laughs> I'll be an no, exciting new. I'm uh, not asking new, you, uh, don't, don't worry about yeah. Uh, well, no, 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 I, I'm sure I'll be able to figure it out. But, <laughs> yeah. So could, uh, could I make, in terms of your pictures, yeah. uh, a, a suggestion. When you first established the triangle by, you know, by basically cutting your cone with a plane, you use an L1 metric. If you use an L2 metric, you would have a spherical triangle and all of your 2D pictures would basically stay the same, but you would already have made the mapping onto the sphere for one segment. But I'm not sure I follow you, I'm afraid. But what, by, let's go back to the slide. But by using an yeah, L2 here. metric. Then, then that plane becomes a, segment, a sphere. You've got a spherical triangle. Oh, what you mean? So we 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 have a we we take a we take just the set of vectors of of constant length. I suppose no, we instead instead of sigma equals 
R1 plus R2, you know, et cetera. You use just the L2 metric. Instead of, instead of a unit distance plane, you make a unit sphere. So you make it, so you make you you just you just say I'll say root r one two squared plus r o one squared plus r o two squared equals some constant. That's right, and so yeah. that plane becomes a segment of a sphere. Your your triangle picture doesn't change, but the map you know now the mapping doesn't really have to be done. You've already got a segment of your sphere. But you'd still have the same problem. But this sphere would be covered in. The, what this would be is a segment of a sphere which, which is covered in spherical triangles, which is which is triangulated. Yes. Uh, and each one of those triangles is kind of a fundamental domain in, in, in some uh, way of that space. And you still have the problem of having to reflect across the boundaries. That's not the, of that's not the sphere you want to get to. Okay. I'm yeah, sure. that's not the sphere. What we, what we want is a mapping. Because this, because really, this one triangle, which is a, also a fundamental domain in, in in many ways, is is a punctured sphere. It's just topologically equivalent, so we can do all sorts. But I, I wouldn't use the words fundamental domain. No, no. This is a configuration space or a configuration space. isometry space. Okay, it's it's not a fundamental domain. It's more it's more fundamental. Yeah, more fundamental. It's like yeah, configuration space. But this yeah. configuration space can be parameterized in many different ways. Yeah. One simple, possibly the simplest parameterization is by this triangular map. Yeah. So two coordinates X and Y. Another parameterization, when we map this triangle onto the northern hemisphere, and then we have different coordinates, but essentially on the same lattice isometry space. Yeah. So of course, this map geometrically is distorted. So topologically, it's the same, but different uh, different coordinates yep. will have uh, different values on, on the sphere. Yeah. That's right. But they all they all continuous deformations from one to another. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I am uh, satisfied. Thank okay. you. No worries. Um, so, Matt, uh, could you could you summarize your part or maybe explain what we will talk um, about next time? So next week, we're just going to delve into the idea of can we apply this to data sets? And as I say, there are there, there are three data sets we've looked at, the CSD, and really what that's mostly illustrating uh, with chirality distance and things is we can get these massive data sets. And this is so easily computable that I can do this in a few minutes on my on my, on my ailing MacBook Air, which I bought in sort of 2016, um, and, and I'm sure could be done much quicker on, on better computers. Uh, then we're going to look at two two dimensional materials, actually, because there is now there are now like when I say large, obviously not 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 we can kind of generate three million lattices here, uh, but there are we're now getting into the thousands, possibly even approaching the tens of thousands of available two dimensional structures, uh, which is enough to, to to be interested in putting them on a continuous map and asking some questions like where where do they live? Do they all live in the same space? Is there any particular reason to expect them to? Uh, we know that things like graphene, obviously, and a lot, lot of elemental things are just hexagonal sheets, but are they all that? Um, and also we can say, can we use our chirality distances to add to the data that we've got to say, well, if you care about um, asymmetry, if you want to make asymmetry lattices, which you do, uh, because they kind of have interesting things like they work electronically and differently in different directions, uh, then, then we can help you find them. And we can help you find them in regions that you know they are going to be plausible, they're not going to explode, and that you can laminate, you can exfoliate them from their bulk material. And then finally, we're going to ask this theoretical question about kind of random lattices, which means oh, there's going to be a brief theoretical detour into what is a random lattice, which is a problem that has been solved by Jens, uh, by Professor Jens Markloff, um, and we can, and how we've applied that to our own invariant uh, to ask this question about whether or not uh, lattices fill the space. Uh, whether or not the lattices we see in nature are in fact kind of in a sense uniform random selections from the, all the lattices there could possibly be and we wouldn't expect them to be and to us to some extent they're not but to some extent they are perhaps a bit more than you would expect we've nature fills the space a bit more nicely than, than you might expect given all the physical constraints so that's the, that that might be next week's story if people would like to come and see it Thank you very much, Matt. Let us thank Matt. <clears throat> very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, I'm stopping recording. Uh